And we've been working on governance in Chennai and we put together a little presentation for you. So, yeah, um, our focus is going to be on the corporation of Chennai and for those of you who don't know, it is the second oldest corporation, city corporation in the world. The first, of course, is London. Um, the Chennai corporation was started in 1688 and it's just survived till today. So, when we talk about governance in Chennai, uh, who are the stakeholders? Um, first and foremost, there are citizens, all of us. I haven't mentioned that here, but you know. then there's the Chennai Corporation itself. Uh, Chennai has 15 zones today and 200 wards. This was after last, uh, last, I mean, last year the uh, restructuring was done in October. Then there are our higher status, which are uh, bodies like the Tamil Nadu Slum Service Board and CMW, I said, CMW, and the Tamil Nadu Electricity Board and so on and so forth. And then we have the Chennai Metropolitan Development Authority, which looks after the Chennai metropolitan area, which is not only the city of Chennai, but a bunch of surrounding areas. Uh, but as I said, our focus is the population for today. So, anyone start? So, um, what does the population of Chennai do? So, the population of Chennai basically provides basic services and infrastructure to cities. So, how does it provide this? How does it uh, provide, but uh, how does it... No, it's okay. How does it uh, allocate money for this? So, we... And provide the service as such. So, you have... So, the corporation has these basic uh, outcomes in life, which include, uh, for, if, for example, like health or housing or education. So, these would come under your outcomes. And then you have, um, so in order to achieve these outcomes, you have certain outputs that they provide, so like in, um, infrastructure and services, which, so if you take sanitation, for example, the uh, outputs for that would include provision of public toilets or garbage connection and so on and so forth. So in order to provide these outputs, it has to have some money to do this. So that comes through its budget. So the corporation of Chennai provides or has a budget session every year, and uh, in this it provides or uh, it allocates money for each department and for each ward. Um, however, what so is ideally what should happen is that these outlays for each outcome should translate into a greater outputs for concerns. To outlays for outputs should translate into outcomes. However, we do see that this does not happen. So, our study or our research in this one month has been to find out why this does not happen or basically to study the coordination structure and the thing. So, one thing that we found was that these service providers, which include the, both the coordination of Chennai and other palatated bodies like the PNEB and PNXCP, do not, uh, are not directly accountable to the citizens of Chennai. And so this creates a problem in uh, getting these services uh, for the poor, or not just to the citizens as such. So, uh, and you have for, and this is further complicated by the fact that for each service or infrastructure, you have several different bodies or several different departments which are responsible for its provision. So, this is an illustration of that. So you have a public toilet. And so as you can see, the structure as such of the public toilet is provided by the buildings department in the COP. And then you have the water and sewage, which is provided by the CN, the USCP or the Chennai Metro Water. And then you have the electricity for the tube lights and all that provided by the DNDB. And uh, in Chennai, so the Maintenance is contracted out to a private uh, enterprise. And uh, so, in order to achieve sanitation and, in a greater way, health, public health, you have all these different bodies that are responsible for provision. Um, so, if one of these does not, uh, if this does not take place perfectly, uh, so you don't have a proper public toilet or a proper usable public toilet. So, as such, so this becomes a problem because it, uh, so this becomes a problem because um, 
This is not a problem for people who have private toilets of their own, but it's more important for those who are dependent solely on these public and community toilets for their uh, on yeah, for their daily use. So, so uh, just to illustrate a few other examples of the way, like a large bunch of people try to do one thing. This is uh, Mount Road, and I think a lot of mayor. So, medians, right? The road, the medians in the middle of the road. Uh, the road department builds the median, then the parks department steps in and goes plants on them and, and they are responsible for the maintenance. So there is a big transition there, but if, if the median, for example, if the median gets destroyed, they are help or rather there is some accident and some parts of the median get damaged. There is again a big transition as to who has to do what. Or let's look at the lake of cables, the roads department lays the road. Um, and uh, to take an example, who wants to lay its cables there, they pick up the road and they have, they're technically supposed to inform the roads department again to relay the road. More often than not, this does not happen. Most often than not, what happens is the relaying is never done properly. You have a shoddy patchwork all over the place. So problems like this exist. And then we found several interesting things when we examined the corporation structure, for instance. Um, and under the CNN URM, under the CNN URM uh, rules, the uh, e-governance is supposed to be implemented in every city. Uh, under the municipal structure of the city. Ridiculously, in, in Chennai, the implementation of e-governance is handed to the electrical department, whose primary function is to maintain and repair street lights in the city. So, that, those are, these are the kind of things we found. The, uh, moving on, the corporation structure, um, it's, this is incomplete, and the, the corporation website does not have a proper structure which is up to date, which includes data for the 200 walls and the 15 zones and all that. So this is just incomplete and I mean we have been able to figure out the hierarchies for just like 3 or 4 departments and this is incomplete. And I assure you this is ordered only because we have tried to order it in this fashion but actually it's not. No one has any clear idea as to who does what at what level. So if you go to the ward office, you don't know who to contact if there is a problem with the street light. At the zone office you don't know how many people are responsible to take care of say your sewage lines or water supply. So these are problems we discovered and yeah, this speaks a lot because well, this is all over the place. And so yeah, what did, what did we try to do? We tried to understand the complexities involved in governance in Chennai. What are the problems? Or what did we find? Basically, it's really fragmented as you saw. Uh, just to give you an example, the solid waste management department in Chennai alone has 9,000 officials. As of 2009, for 10 zones. Today there are 15 zones and God knows how many official, uh, how many employees they have. So that's a big problem. No one knows who sits at the ward level, at the zone level, at the corporation office in the different building. No one knows who sits where. The citizens certainly don't know. We hope that the administration has some idea as to the hierarchy properly. Um, like I said, no clear understanding of who does what. More, more, most importantly, the citizens don't have a say in anything that happens. For example, if I want to, I want to use street light on my street, which they will be talking about later, I don't know who to approach. I don't know how my request is going to be taken forward. These are problems which are very currently uh, people face in our city. Up to date data, um, if you visit the corporation website or even if you visit the corporation office, most offices lack even an organizational chart. Most data, all, all the data you find is valid as of October 2009. Nothing, the, the zone, the redrawing of the, chain, the division of zones has not been taken into account in most cases. And in fact, the building department data, uh, or the organization chart, uh, not chart exactly, but data on the uh, post positions in the department are, uh, I mean, the last time they updated was in 1947, but the 1947 structure is given, so you don't have any idea how it is now. Yes, so and most, uh, finally we still, the corporation still runs under the guidance of the Chennai, yeah, the CCMC Act 1990, which is periodically updated or so they say, but again, okay. it, it, it sounds funny that we're still running based on a set of laws and on a framework which was drawn over the almost a century back. And then you run into other problems of, let's say, today if you look at the Hindu, for instance, we, we, we all saw that the CMDA has, um, I think it's the development certificate, the CMDA has refused to devolve the power to issue that certificate to the population. So, problems like these surface all the time 
which ultimately bring us to the question has the 74th amendment which was aimed at decentralizing all these powers and processes, has it actually worked? Um, does the corporation ultimately have the power to do its own thing and you know function the way it would like to independent of you know political problems and what um, they are running the problems from higher authorities like I said the CMDA was responsible for planning in Chennai, things like that. So yeah, this is what we found in, in a very broad sense. Vishnu and Nigeshala are going to talk about the production of speech like this. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Nigeshala. We've been working on uh, the issue of street lights in the Chennai city of Chennai. Now, uh, about what we've been doing regarding street lights is that we've been trying to understand who are the people who are involved in providing street lights. Is it just the electrical <coughs> department, electrical department? Or is it also the building department right to post and the host of different other departments involved in uh, providing the service of street light? And what do they provide? Is it only the installing installation of street light or is it also the repairs and all other issues related to the street light? And how do they do it? How do they plan it? Do they have a particular procedure? Or do they follow a particular rules, rules and guidelines to plan the provision of street light? Now the relevant as to why we've been working on street light is that like what Suraj and Asha have pointed out, there is a very complex picture of, uh, for example, say a particular citizen or a councillor, the way he looks at the different services being provided to him is very complex. He does not know who is providing what and the, at the different levels of coordination that go on to provide one particular service. So by looking at street light, we have tried to understand what are, what are the problems and uh, and try to uh, address one particular part of this big picture. And uh, moving on to methodology. Yeah, uh, to find out the, to proceed with the project, we have to read the corporation website. So, like Surat said, there was not many information to be given. One, the, the basic hierarchy of the department is not given. And the number of street lights were according to the previous year, which where there were only 10 zones. And now there are 15 zones added, and they didn't give the number of street lights for the present year. And the other one was the distribution of the street lights were not given. So we had to read the department uh, hierarchy you know, from the website, which was not given. So we had to go visit the corporation officials to get all these information. And for that is that is not an easy job. Like we had to go, like we have to have a lot of patients, we have to wait a long time, and um, and then you get like a small bit of information and then you come back to again, work on it again, three portions. We forgot to get another information and we got uh, Yeah, so after that we spent two days at the Chennai Corporation office and we really didn't find anything but uh, later on we happened to meet one person who gave us a lot of Yeah, he was very useful for our project and we had to go meet the zonal offices to, to find out how the corporation and zone offices, these zone offices work. And then the process, process was first I uh, start the structure. The structure is first the uh, super engineer, then comes the, uh, and then the divisional engineer, and then assistant divisional engineer, then the assistant engineer or the junior engineer, then the Lighting inspector, then the electrician, and then the electrical laborers. The assistant engineer comes, assistant from the assistant engineer. They work in the zonal office and not in the corporation office. So, like, we, we had to go to the zone offices to find out how they coordinate with the corporation office. And the function of each uh, office is, like, each person in the hierarchy was First, to install a street light was first the super uh, goes from down. First, the uh, sorry, uh, yeah, it starts from the A who proposes the street light, and then the assistant divisional engineer uh, assists the inspects the site, and then the the original engineer proposes to the super engineer and then he sanctions it. And the finance is 
is a big question mark for us because we tried to find out, but we didn't get enough information. Yeah. Uh, on to the funding and uh, regarding finance. Now, uh, there's an annual budget, the regional corporation, and uh, we have, there's an amount allocated to the electrical department as well as to the award office which is for the provincial street light. The electrical department spends some amount for the provincial street light. At the same time, the, the councillor also spends the amount if he feels that he wants to provide, uh, if he feels that people need more street light. Uh, he also spends the amount. So there is an independent, uh, there is a spending which is independent of the uh, two different bodies. As in, the superintendent engineer spends the, the amount provided to him for the street as well as the council spends the the amount given to him for the street life. So there is no specific coordination between, between these two uh, bodies and they are independent. And regarding the regulations, this is what we got from uh, interviewing the officials there. They follow these regulations by categorizing the roads into uh, interior roads, arterial roads, and the bus roads. So, depending on the road and the width of the road, the specific uh, street light is provided. Now, this comes in handy, especially when you want to match the ground reality as to what you have been provided uh, with what you are entitled to be provided and what you are entitled to receive. So, I think at that juncture, this is uh, useful. And uh, moving on to the analysis. Now, uh, what what we did come across was that the process of installing streetlight uh, begins based on three different factors. Now, uh, the factor number one being the site itself. If the officials feel that the site needs streetlight, they can go ahead with providing streetlight. Number two, if there is a representation from the public that they want streetlight, they can go ahead with providing streetlight. Number three, if the councillor himself comes and approaches the officials and asks them for the provision of streetlight, they can go ahead with it. So basically there are these three factors and based on these three factors the process starts. Now we found that there are three, uh, that there are problems from different perspectives. Now from the point of view of the administrator, if you look at the, uh, the data that they have, they have data regarding the number of street lights in each zone, but they do not have any data regarding the distribution of street lights. Let go of maps, but any, uh, any data regarding the distribution of street lights. So I think them or their planning of how to provide street lights depends largely on feedback from public and council because they are not in a position to decide where to put it because they only have quantitative data regarding how many are there in each different, uh, in each of the zones. Now from the point of view of the public, the public are, there is no clear picture regarding whom to approach and where are the avenues of intervention. Now, because the official procedure is that the public has to submit the request to the junior engineer and the junior engineer will have to give specifications as to uh, what is the kind of street light that, that are suited for that particular place and the council has to approve both the request by comparing the junior engineer and the engineer's uh, data as in both together are approved by the council. So these, these kind of procedures as well as the revenues of intervention are not known to the public. When we uh, spoke to the councillor of uh, Ward 185, uh, the zone D, Kala he, he uh, spoke to us regarding the play of politics in uh, the Chennai Corporation's uh, administration because he apparently is not from uh, the currently favoured party and uh, his uh, proposal for setting up a street light has been uh, it's, it's just stagnant at one particular desk and it's just not moving. So there are these procedural uh, problems that he uh, faced. So there are so many problems from different uh, perspectives. So I think taking out from the councillor's problem, there is also uh, the issue of inequality and disparity of service. Now uh, there are roads and there are sections of the city which are very well known and visibility is not an issue at all. At the same time there are these places which face uh, problems with visibility and street light. And I think that uh, boils down to the fact that you know there are there are different power plays and not just for uh, the politics but also issues of media. So I think uh, something that provides an answer to all this is, an, is the issue of accountability. Now uh, regarding accountability and you know, why accountability is important in this in, in the context where we have a lot of contractors and also in the context where there are problems procedures is that uh, accountability helps us in, in two different ways. Number one being that uh, in that it, it tries to bring down the inequality by making the entire, that is, as in, by bringing an accountability, you can make sure that the officials are answerable to the public at large and not just to a particular group of people. So in that case, it brings down or breaks down the inequality. And number two, we realize that 
uh, in any of these regulations and specifications, there is no specific, uh, you know, there is no specific mention of the quality of service. Now, if you look at the Chennai Corporation website, it will tell you that there are so many street lights and uh, in so many different zones and all that. But there is no uh, mention of the quality of the service. For example, the contractor might have, uh, might as well put a very low quality uh, wire and a low quality uh, post and stuff like that. So, how do we make sure that these the, that the quality is also taken care of. I think accountability account and accountability will address such issue. And uh, uh, basically the council, which uh, is composed of the councillors, decides the outlay of money for the street lights in all different other uh, service uh, provision. So I think, I'm not sure if there is any uh, legal provision of accountability, you know, accountability relationship between the superintendent engineer and the council. But if there is, I think that has to be uh, strengthened and stepped up. And if it is not, I think that is where uh, the accountability should be brought in. Because uh, the accountability is not towards a senior official, but the accountability is towards the people's representatives that will bring, bring out the outcomes that we really want. Uh, yeah, yeah the suggestions. Uh, we, after analyzing all this, we thought like it could be addressed in long term and short term. The long term being, like Krishna said, uh, there's political in, politics in corporation. So because of that, the files don't move. And the counselor should, and the count, there's no, uh, the superintendent engineer doesn't work under the counselor. So counselor doesn't have any, you know, power on superintendent engineer. So that, he should have some kind of power. For him to, you know, ask, let's see, ask him to move forward with the process. And in the short run, like, you know, the, you should, the public is not aware of the timeline for the, for a particular agreement should be solved. So the, the timeline should be made available to the uh, public so that they, they can also, you know, ask questions to the officials who are responsible for reducing the grievance. Uh, and yes, uh, like what you said regarding the timeline factor. So without the timeline factor, I think we return to the same interesting situation where we have the RTI and we have, the, I don't know if uh, this has been uh, advertised in all the papers. There is the section in the Chennai Corporation website which uh, talks about the public grievance uh, uh, addresses itself, which apparently has brought out this uh, new initiative of telling you which stage your complaint is in now. I think it is not just about uh, you giving your complaint, it also tells you which stage has it reached, has it reached this official or that official. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it might amount to what the uh, council was telling us. It can, the website can still tell you that this is this test, and even 15 days later, it can still tell you that this is at the same test. So I think without the time factor or a framework which tells you that this is when you can expect it, I think we come back to the, you know, we are left to the same tools and the same thing. So I think that sort of sums up our work. Being threatened. 
So that basically is gender uh, safety. And uh, the physical environment around us adds a feeling of uh, being safe or unsafe to a woman. So uh, we try to uh, list up the factors which make uh, a woman feel unsafe uh, or safe in a public space where she is. So uh, that's what we did with the auditing. And um, women say, uh, since women face uh, abusive and public spaces, uh, we try to ask these women about what sort of abuses they face and uh, how it could be uh, you know, how it could be avoided. And uh, uh, according to the Metcalf, uh, women's safety and gender safety is the freedom from threat, fear, and experience of all kinds of uh, violence, oppression, and discrimination. After we talk about um, how the audit go and why an audit is important. And Rashaan can talk about the investment part. So, so. Hello, my name is Nadia. Uh, when we also said, given the challenge of uh, gender dignity, it was really a tricky, uh, tricky challenge. So, in order to campaign, uh, in order to figure out how a woman, uh, as a person, in terms of especially uh, what is their perception about the public space, especially regarding the field of uh, safety, uh, we had to do a lot of brainstorming and uh, in there we adopted the methodology of audit. First of all, you have to know what an audit is. An audit is, uh, it was first, uh, for, it, it has an audience, audience in Canada, it was uh, designed by Metra. In which it is actually a group of women who have a walk to, come, uh, to a public space and evaluate those factors which deem it safe or unsafe. So why an audit? That, uh, so that comes of what is an audit and why an audit? An audit is a comp gives a comprehensive view of the user of the space. Especially women and what their perception of the space is. For example, is she feeling threatened in the presence of an auto man or auto driver, or is she feeling uh, threatened in the presence of a street vendor? So, all it, it uh, compared to surveys and focus for a group discussions, which have lots of uh, negative uh, cause of its own, all it, uh, all it deletes all those judgmental aspects of uh, surveys as well as focus group discussions. Uh, it gives the user's point of view rather than an uh, uh, outsider's thought. So for, 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 uh, if you ask a user, especially a woman, what are the factors she can uh, um, enumerate? What are the factors which contribute to the safety, rather than from an outsider's point of view? So uh, we adopted the uh, methodology of audit, which was very flexible and which was very useful. And uh, we have continued uh, uh, around 150 audits, uh, approximately uh, 150 uh, sessions, and uh, around five uh, bus stops. And uh, we chose, we split into groups, and we chose two uh, bus stops in Kisia and one in Obama and uh, uh, Madhigalash and Gandhi Mandaba where we were able to find uh, surprisingly a lot of factors which made women feel threatened as well as women feel too, which would be explained by Prashant. We choose uh, four to five bus stops across the southern uh, part of the city and we try to uh, <coughs> Say, come up with, okay, ask for uh, one of the factors that's affected them. If, you know, in a more open sort of way, you sort of close patterns like how we did with the, we usually do with the survey. And, but, this is it all. This is, is that all. Ask go to go to place, ask what they want to do, and say, bring some local changes only to that space. So we thought a little more. How about making something which can be compared across places? If you go for an audit in its original form, you just see what's in that place, come up with the local solution, and yeah, we have to start recommendations. But we also thought, why not say, create some tape sort of thing or a standard sort of thing so that this can be made usable across places. Say, compare one bus stop in Chennai and say, my HD is like compare it with Delhi or Mera tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Today, I'm Paul Arbon and yes, so that, and say, Gandhi Mandu. Uh, whether they say, and we can even across this, this standard sir, actually if those two bus stops are actually safe, or what are the factors provided in each of the bus stops, you can also make comparisons on how the government treats people of different places differently. So these are the uh, things we have brainstorming about and we finally come up with the government come up with an index. Yeah, I tell you why the index is. And going to most of the literature on the issue of gender safety. Uh, we found many of the factors that affect it. 
the safety of a woman in a public space can be affected by, or can be broadly classified into disability. I mean, the ability to be see, see others and being seen yourself. You have, I hope you understand what it is. And yeah, security is basically people, yeah, the policemen going around with the party, ensuring the reality is not harder. And then there's access, whether you can and uh, can actually do what, and especially for women, do what she wants. It's not about, uh, as in, to access, not only really use the place as such, to get to that is also an important thing. Take the, uh, yeah, take the MRK stations, yeah, they are smoothly by the but yeah, getting to most MRK stations, pedestrians are, it's a really difficult thing to do. So, even the access to the uh, public space as such has to be safe, and we sort of uh, try to assist that as well. Yeah, assessing access. <laughs> yeah, and comfort. The place as such needs to be usable for the moment. The difference in needs for women and men are different. And most, you know, mind, most of the times we say that uh, the place are desired, desired. The design of the probably insensitive to the minor differences a woman might need. Uh, on the top of my mind, I can't Yeah, so we call indexing all the art, making an index, measuring all these things. The difference between the audit and the index is, you can, even though it looks like uh, the particular issue, the, through the methodology we are talking, though, though we look at the particular issues that affect the case, we also try to uh, sort of measure how we can think about these four things. I mean, uh, came up with elements. For example, visibility would include lighting, the lack of obstructions, security would, yeah, the most police guys, uh, and access would include, say, uh, footwork which is how they are maintained, subways, which are, yeah, you know, tonight it's never used, you just cross over the video. And comfort, which is, uh, the seats, how the platforms are uh, platforms are maintained. If you look at most bus stops, for example, come, come to uh, comfort, the bus stops are small, are so small, are not existing, that people actually use the road. And uh, a woman is a lot more disadvantaged in, uh, yeah, I don't want to get something to say. Okay, I'll go to the next slide. Bus bus way, you can see sort of in the area, you can see a number of plate over there, the GPS reading thing. Now these things are provided just, but you can see there are no lights provided. The view is almost uh, almost sunset and the lights are not there. So these are all, all the elements we try to measure. We asked the people, we went on like, uh, we, asked, we asked almost 50 people, 30 to 50 people for the stop and asking them to brand or uh, or tell their opinion about whether a certain element was of importance or uh, certain thing about was of importance or of death or any we yeah, we classified the various things that are. So we divided the, the outputs into various things and these are things we asked them. How the yeah, the these stands of visibility. We asked how the lighting was, how the condition of the lights were, how the obstructions were. Uh, the condition is essentially how the street lights are dedicated lights are here. So this lighting, the lighting is actually high and the condition of the lights are very poor. We get to know that the lights of the bus stops are actually poor. The lighting is there, but it's not from the dedicated solution the government is trying to do for the bus stops. So these kind of comparisons can be made through our index and we are responsible by the chart. And uh, thanks to this for coming in with this. And the dark spot trending is very high. Means that the people, the women especially, are being really trending about the. No, actually, they are. Uh, it's pretty high. It means that uh, the people, this actually means that uh, there are no dark spots in this uh, locality, and the uh, women actually feel quite safe. And you see, this is the comfort zone, and this looks pretty comfortable. They are all rating it pretty high. But if you come to the access part. It's totally, there is no, there's not a single pedestrian uh, signal, there's not a, uh, uh, what is uh, the photo bridges, there's nothing. So people cannot, are finding it difficult to access the bus stop at such. So that way this place, 
uh, gets a lower rating in this part. So overall, you can measure all the aspects we have designed through this uh, index. And ideally, ideally, the condition should be that the whole chart should be completed. Unfortunately, it's not. It's not even half full. Uh, and what are the issues we ask? In the audits, we ask all of specific reasons. They told specifically that the lights did not work because uh, there was actually a light right in front of the, above, above the bus stop, which is not it was broken. So these kind of uh, issues cropped up for the particular bus stop. And there was vehicles, uh, it is right next to a flyover. So vehicles were usually trying to speed out the way. So the access also got, uh, uh, the access was also difficult to write from the opposite side. And being a prime bus stop and serving a lot of people, the bus stop by itself was maintained well. It had a good room, it had uh, adequate, uh, uh, the seats were actually used to be maintained, but there, because it was a very uh, but, uh, important bus stop and a major bus stop, the seats capacity was naturally very low. And yeah, so they uh, went down on those areas. So this is Palo up in Vasta. It lies like 20 km, 10 to 15 km outside the city. This is a, this was brought up into the bot, into the uh, corporation very recently last year. So, and the deal, and all these things are early, earlier handled by the panchayats or the uh, the highways panels did not look much into these they are. The, this either did not have resources or did not have the interest. But being in the outside outskirts of the city, uh, or rather, you know, just comes about, uh, yeah, it does inside it. And uh, the, it develop, it's developing fast. Right? And you know what we see are the same as what? Drinking, partying. And, yeah, and also, so, you and the no famous landmark of our park, which is like in these suburbs, apparently. And these kind of issues are uh, greatly affecting the uh, bus stop park, follow up. And the issues they brought up was also similar, the lighting. At least Gandhi Pantanam uh, is on a major road and it has the lights provided provide for the road rather than the bus stop. But Palavatam, despite being on ECR, does not really have any proper lighting. So that was a major concern for them. And there was a bus light given right on top of the bus stop. But it was comfortably placed above, just above the road, providing no use. It was just consuming electricity. Nothing else. And yeah, you can see the picture of the here. Sydney actor very well, probably the like nothing else. And there's also a task map bar or something like that uh, close by, and that causes a lot of. That meant that people used to uh, drink and lie down on the chair to shelter in the bus stop in the night. So that also affected the uh, safety position of how many people during the night. So when we ask people to rate things, they're very really happy with the location because it's right in the center of the city right in the center of uh, the town and the maintenance was pretty okay but and so uh, sorry and so the usability but on lighting and how the roof and etc uh, roof etc roof and all that was the maintenance was very poor and you can see the difference more people access it Gandhi Vandam is maintained well but many a uh, few people no one would uh, access it and this Gandhi Vandam is obviously the more important uh, area where the Palavatam is just another sandy town. And, yeah, so, so there was basically no seat capacity, there was no seat capacity. No one used it. Uh, sorry, no one could use it rather than, there was just a bench lying on which the problem had done, but you can see. Uh, yeah, and this is the findings and, sorry. Any questions? No, 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 no. And there are a lot of gaps because uh, like the data we collected, we did not sell it, uh, we, uh, we collected around 40 to 50 people from the bus stop. So that's, a, that's an issue we thought uh, might have, will be a problem. My hope is that working on this further, we can come up with a better index, but uh, better index, which is, uh, look at other elements, possibly other actors like visibility. We have listed down for Probably we can come up with more. And the authenticity of the data will be uh, the oh sorry the yeah it will be more uh, 
authentically we cover more bus stops, more spaces, more places, more opinions. And this, I hope this index for a bus stop can be shifted to other places as well, say beach instead, other places. Thanks.